and I'm very excited to tell you what we do in the lab. I hope I can convey it in a way that, you know, we can make it as simple as possible and then we can discuss about it and I can answer any questions you would have. Now, we are interested in understanding the immune system, how the immune system works, and in particular, how we can regulate it, okay? So one of the ways that I like to think about the immune system is that we can make an analogy and think that when our immune system is turned on, it's like a car. And I like cars. I don't know you. Do I have people that like cars in the audience? <laughs> yes? Okay. Oh, oh, claro que sí. Okay. Well, I have one in Spanish. Great. Uh, okay. So let's imagine we have a, an unrestricted budget, not something very common, and we can get a wonderful, wonderful car. Do I have anybody in the audience? It can be in Spanish. It can be in, a, in a, any language. Somebody can choose a car that would like to buy. A Maserati? A Lamborghini. A Lamborghini. Yeah, wow, those are great cars. Okay. Uh, this is one I like. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I like the Aston Martin. Um, so let's think about our immune system. When it's been activated, it's like an Aston Martin or a Maserati or a Lamborghini, and it's going to be turned on. Now, there are some fundamental cells that are going to be the drivers of our immune response, of this car. And those cells are one of the main focus of my lab. These cells are known as antigen-presenting cells. That's why it says APC. But just remember, they are the main drivers. They can turn on this car, they can turn on the immune response. And they can do that because they have the ability to recognize microbes. So if we get infected, these cells can tell our body we've been infected. And the reason is because these cells have some proteins, some receptors, they're indicated in these cartoons. That's it? Oh, yeah. Let's see. Let's put this word up here. These cells have these proteins, these receptors, shown here, that allows them to recognize things that are very different in the microbes. They are very different from our own cells, right? And so when they are exposed to that, through these receptors, they can turn this car on. And one of the main things that these antigen-presenting cells will do is they will activate other cells, known as T cells, doesn't matter, they are very, very important, but doesn't matter too much for this uh, conversation, but they will activate the T cells with which they very, very closely interact. And they will also lead to the activation of those B cells, and you know, as Hope was saying, some of the new therapies target those B cells. And it is in this way that our immune system will recognize the microbes, the viruses, the bacteria, the parasites, and will mount an immune response. And this is great. Hopefully, it is through this interaction that then we can clear the pathogen. Now, in biology, in the immune response, it's great to be able to react, but usually when there is a response, you want to be able to regulate it. You want to have the adequate amount of the response, and you want it to be controlled temporarily. You don't want to react too much, right? You don't want to react forever. So I would like to ask you, if we go back to our cars of choice, how good this cars be, how would they would be without brakes. <laughs> and so what we are interested is trying to understand those brakes that actually do exist, that control how intense and how prolonged this immune response will be. And that 
is one of the focus of my lab. So if we now go back to the main drivers, to those antigen-presenting cells, we know that there are mechanisms, we have drawn them here in red, and we know that those breaks are engaged as a consequence of the immune response. And we know that that is important to keep the immune response in check. Now, you might be wondering, how do we know that? We know that because we can use animal models where we can disable these inhibitory pathways, right? We can make an animal mod model in which we will take this break. So if we take the break of these antigen-presenting cells, what would you imagine it will happen? Any ideas? We have... <laughs> I, now there's a Yes, it goes a little bit cuckoo. Yeah, imagine. So now, you know, these cells will not be able to be turned down, right? Will be hyperactivated. Mm -hmm. And we have done that. So the pathway, the receptors that we study, they have some names. I'll just tell you so that maybe, you know, you, you learn more details about this. We call them TAMs and they're shown here, this is their structure. That's not so important for this talk. But we have made mice in which these receptors are gone. And if you make those mice, if you take this break, this is what happens. These are the lymph nodes of normal mice. This is where those cells that I introduced you are. If you now take that break, look at the size of these lymph nodes. They are very much enlarged. And that is because now these cells are more activated and there are more of them. So we have increased lymph nodes. We also have increased spleen. And important for you, and maybe you can see you can relate to this data here. And this is, you know, real data from the research that we do. You are very familiar with the fact that sometimes when things go wrong and you hyperreact or you react against yourself, you have autoantibodies, right? You know that, right? Okay, we can measure that in these animal models in which we have taken this break. So I will ask you, that you focus here on this panel E. And I'll show you the data on how it looks. What we do there is we measure the amount of autoantibodies, in this case it's to a particular molecule, it's double-stranded DNA, but these are reacting against self. You don't want to have them. In a normal mouse, the levels are very low. It's where it says WT, that's the control. Okay, it's a wild-type mouse. They're very low, you can see that? Now, if we take away that break that I told you, is the second set of results. Here where it says TAM, you can see that these mice have significantly higher levels of these autoantibodies. So I've shown you that if we can take this break, we know there are more cells, they're more activated, and as a consequence, we have more autoantibodies. So we knew that, but we really wanted to understand how can we actually push the break? How can we engage the break and prevent this from happening, right? So I've told you that this mechanism is driven by these receptors, right? TAM receptors that are on our favorite cells, the APCs. <coughs> so with the grant from the LRI, we became very interested in trying to understand how can we engage this pathway. In biology, if you have a receptor, you can use something that can activate. It's called an agonist or the endogenous ligand. And so what we hypothesize, and I think this is very beautiful, I'm, I'm excited about this, <laughs> uh, is that if this cell is going to activate a T cell. I've shown you that at the very beginning. If this cell is going to activate a T cell, you would imagine that a beautiful way to control how much this cell will become activated is as a consequence 
of T cell activation. So what we postulated was that once the T cells become activated, they will tell our favorite cells, okay, you've done your job. They will press this break. They will produce this ligand to push the break through the TAM receptors in the APCs. So that was our hypothesis. We knew that TAMs were the break, and we hypothesized that now when T cells will become activated, they will tell the APC, okay, you've done your job, you can be turned off. There are two proteins that can push the break. They are shown here in this cartoon in green, and that's what we've worked on. And just to make a long story short, I will tell you that we indeed discover, with support of the LRI, that when T cells become activated, when they are responding, they make the ligand that will push this break and that will terminate the activation of the main drivers of the immune response. Now to make things a little bit uh, more simple, I would like to depict this with a cartoon. What I've shown you is that these antigen-presenting cells, which are also called dendritic cells, what they do is they activate the T cells, and that's great, but they need to know when to stop. And so what we've discovered is that when T cells become activated, they engage this break to terminate the response of the dendritic cells. You might be wondering, okay, why would this be maybe important in lupus? What we know is that in a fraction of patients with different autoimmune diseases, there is deficiency, there are reduced levels of this molecule that pushes the break. Now, I want to be very clear here. Lupus is a very, very complex disease. And this is not going to be the only thing. But we are interested in trying to understand whether by making less of this protein that pushes the break, whether this could contribute to autoimmune diseases. And that's what's going to be our efforts in the years to come. Now, of course, you cannot do this alone. You really have to assemble a great group of people, and that's a fundamental aspect of what we do. And the work that I've shown you was done by various people in my lab, and particularly by a very talented postdoc, Antonio Carrera Silva. We could have not done this without the support of the LRI, and we had wonderful collaborators in other institutions. So I hope I had introduced you to a way in which our immune response is regulated. We know now who are those molecules, and hopefully we can understand better whether we can target those molecules in order to control how much that car is going forward. Thank you.